there. I'm Sarah A. Christman, the author of The Tales of Chetsamoka. I'm Gabriel Christman, her husband. <laughs> and proprietor of Victorian Cycles. Mm -hmm. Today, Gabriel's going to tell you a little bit about the ordinary bicycle. These are the bikes that a lot of the characters in my, my series ride. Okay, so today I was going to tell you a little bit about the ordinary bicycle, the bicycle people rode in the 1880s, and especially the bicycle that is being ridden by the characters in Sarah's books. So, this was indeed an ordinary bicycle at the time. It was the popular type of bicycle. It was the first really popular bicycle uh, of all time, in fact, and the reason for calling it an ordinary bicycle was to set it aside from all of the other types of bicycles that people were trying to invent, uh, including the safety bicycle, which is what later became the modern bicycle that we all know. So, these are far less dangerous than people assume. Everyone assumes that it's really unstable, that it's really high up there and, and feels really odd, but to them these were completely normal. They were used to sitting up high on horses, and these bicycles certainly weren't any higher than that. In fact, they were a little bit lower in many cases. And they're actually more stable than a modern bicycle because that large wheel acts like a gyroscope and really allows you to balance safely even at lower speeds than a modern bicycle. And the position that you're in riding these bicycles is very comfortable. You're very upright. You're not having to bend over like on a modern bicycle. And it's just, it's a very comfortable position to ride long distances and it's very, it's very natural feeling when you're on these bikes. So one of the first questions I get, of course, is how do you get on? So there's a little step back here, and that is the trick to getting on. So you use the same step for getting off, and it ends up being very simple to do. So you simply put your left foot up on the step, hold onto the handlebars like this, and with about two pushes, you're then up and on the bike. As you can see, I can balance this at very slow speeds, which is helpful when it comes to getting off. Simply reach back, find the step, and drop down like that. Getting off is the part that takes more practice, and so one of the things about these bicycles is that they were the first bikes that these people who were buying them in the 1880s had ever ridden. So they included lessons. Anyone who was selling you a bike was usually teaching you how to ride that bicycle as well. And it was done indoors most of the time because people didn't want to be seen well until they were uh, very capable on the bicycle, of course. It was very obvious riding one of these down the street, especially when they were new, and you didn't want to be looking incompetent while riding it, let alone falling off. So they would include a lesson, a set of lessons, in fact, on how to ride. And those lessons still work. The uh, way I was taught how to ride these bikes by a, an older wheelman followed exactly the same set of instructions that Jacob would be teaching customers at his store. And it's just a, a simple set of, of progressions where you move forward from balancing on the step to coasting on the step to actually getting on and pedaling the bike. And of course the hardest part of all of it is that jump that you have to uh, make from being on the bike and riding it to then being able to learn how to get off. And you have to be able to learn how to ride the bike slightly before you learn how to get off. And so it's a matter of sometimes you're, when I was learning, I was riding the bike and riding the bike and I didn't want to stop riding the bike because I didn't want to have to reach back and find that step. So you just kept riding. There were some amazing riders who got amazing skills. So the, the characters that Sarah writes about who do trick riding in the books, um, Ken, and then most especially Peter, are not just made up. They are actually based very directly on real trick riders who are written about in the magazines. So the trick riders had incredible skill that they developed in a fairly short time on these bicycles just by exploring what was possible to do on a bicycle. 
and they had no preconceptions. They had no idea about what the what the limits were, and so part of the idea was they just were able to explore and find out all the all the various things you could possibly do on a bicycle. Many of which are beyond my imaginings now. And um, I can do one of the tricks that they described, which is riding from the step. So this one, you'd ride basically standing on the step, and you'd reach forward, and I'm going to pedal with just one leg to be able to reach forward and do that. So. That's just a little bit of mild trick riding. Now there's a, uh, a couple features on here that I'm just going to call your attention to. The bicycle does have a brake right up here in the front. And this presses, it's a little spoon that presses down onto the tire. And it doesn't do a whole lot. The main way you slow down on this bike is with your legs. So the pedals are directly connected to the axle here. So that means that they never stop turning. When the wheel is in motion, the pedals go whichever direction the wheel is going. So, the main way you slow the bike down is by just resisting those pedals with your legs on the back side of the pedal stroke. And that allows you to slow the bike. The little brake is mostly there to give you something to hang on to while you're going down a steep hill to feel like you're being effective. And that's a psychological benefit that I'm sure they understood. You can see I've got a couple bags here on the backbone of the bicycle. This is a way that you could carry things when you were touring. But the other way you would carry things is you would tie them across the top of the handlebars. That would be where you'd put your bedroll and your jacket and anything else like that. Of course, that did get in the way of something else that was really fun about these bicycles, which was how you coast. So how do you coast if the pedals don't stop moving? Well, you take your feet off the pedals. But the problem with doing that is that if you take your feet off the pedals and just hang them out to the sides, first, it, it's pretty ungainly. And second, if you do crash, and crashes were pretty rare on these, but if you do, your legs were trapped under the handlebars, and you would basically just crash into the ground. There was nothing you could do. So, to coast, they hung their legs over the handlebars. That way, if they went forward, they just land on their feet and run away. So, I'm going to demonstrate coasting for you. This does mean that I have to find a hill to ride down. It's a little hard to coast on flat ground. see a little bit of a coast right there. There's not much of a hill, so I couldn't coast for too long. But if you have a good run out on a hill, you can coast and get going pretty fast on these things, about as fast as your courage will allow. Of course, steep hills are something that most people wouldn't want to coast. And in fact, one of the first road signs that existed in the world was a sign that said, warning bicyclists, steep hill ahead. So that's the first road sign for traffic control and ideas like that. That was one of the bugle commands for a lot of the clubs. Clubs were a huge part of the 1880s world, and of course that's why Sarah's book Center on a Cycling Club. The riders in the 1880s really were a part of that culture and a part of the time. They were politically influential, they were socially influential, and they were very obvious out on the street wearing their uniforms and their knickers, which if you recall from the first book, of course, knickers were a little bit of a, a novelty to see on grown men in the 1880s. And so when Kitty made the pair for Doc, that was a, an unusual sight in town, of course. But it was something that people really noticed, and the clubs were a way to bring that forward and, and make it more of a an element of the culture, uh, fit in with a lot of the the 
the way that people interacted at the time. There were a lot of fraternal organizations, there were a lot of clubs, there were a lot of things that people did socially that now they might be doing alone. But in the late 19th century, everyone wanted to do things sort of in a, in a group and just fit together that way. And often those groups became really close friends, and that's what you find in Sarah's books. Thank you for watching today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a nice thumbs up and remember to tell your friends about my books. Happy reading!